In this home theater builder video, I want to talk about incorporating video games into a theater space, some of the benefits of doing so, and some of the things to watch out for. Per my prior comments, I enjoy video games a lot, and I've been a gamer for a number of decades since at-home console video games really properly even started. And a home theater space is effectively the ultimate place to enjoy gaming. The thing about gaming in a dedicated, fully outfitted room though, with massive immersive screens and full-blown audio, is that you're talking, engaging with that environment in an active way. Watching movies and listening to music in our spaces is awesome, but it's functionally passive entertainment, passive engagement. It's exceptional, sure, but playing games in such a way brings an entire new level of dimensionality to the space. So if you've slept on gaming in general, or trying to bring your gaming console or PC into your theater space, I cannot push you enough to give it a try. Today's games and gaming hardware brings in the entire gamut of technology and then some that our home theater spaces are built for. 4K imagery, HDR, surround sound and positional slash immersive audio, yes, yes, yes. And it's gaming, not video content, that will drive display technology further faster with actually using HDMI 2.1 features for higher refresh rates and onward into real 8K imagery. I'll run down the gamut of the four main gaming sources and hit on the highlights of what it means to put each one into a theater space. Suffice to say that for every source now, integration simply involves HDMI power and ideally a wired ethernet connection, but Wi-Fi works too if you have to. So let's talk Nintendo first. The Switch is the weakest of the crop of gaming platforms that we have available to us now, and it really is last generation tech, also held back by the dual mobile and dockable form factor of the device. Us gamers have been waiting impatiently to see a 4K Switch upgrade for a while, but alas, it remains elusive, maybe 2022. As is, to integrate a Switch in a home theater environment, you really just need the console and the dock. The dock may or may not come with all the Switch hardware packages or versions of the console, so be aware. The dock, though, gives you the needed HDMI output. Docked, a Switch is capable of a paltry 1080p output and 5.1 compressed audio. Meh. But we don't buy Nintendo hardware or games for their technical prowess, historically. We buy them for their fun factor, their characters, and so on. So load up on a few Switch Pro controllers and take some family and friends into the theater and fire up Mario Kart, Mario Party, Tennis, Golf, or any of the great multiplayer games available. I can remember back to college when we had some pretty meager two-channel stereo setups and some smaller CRT TVs, but we would play Mario Kart on the N64, and we would crank that volume so loud that we were probably blowing the neighbors out of their house. It was awesome. With Nintendo, you can play Solo 2 and give the recent Zelda Open World games a try. And while Nintendo loses on the technical aspects again, it excels in fun factor and gameplay. In the years since buying it at launch, my Switch has never been played outside of its dock, always been used in a legit display and audio system environment. So don't let the mobile form factor errantly turn you off to it. Next, let's talk PlayStation. The PS5, of course, is the latest iteration of the PlayStation platform available since late 2021 and still, of course, pretty hard to find. But the PS5 is a console powerhouse coming in two flavors, a disc and a digital edition. The actual console horsepower and all of its features as such are the same between the two models. It's just the disc drive, whether you have it or not. And in my opinion, I can't fathom buying games on physical media anymore. So double thumbs up for the all digital edition for me. The PS5 is gonna kick out the expected 4K, HDR, and 60 frames per second. And some games are actually now supporting 120 FPS as well. The PS5 is an HDMI 2.1 device, but it is somewhat limited bandwidth, so it's color compressing and so on up to 120 FPS. Despite all its power, it's still a console though. And while it'll output 4K, note that many games will render dynamic resolution to maintain frame rate, so the source material will usually actually be less than native 4K. Last console generation, 30 frame per second games were more than norm, which is really meh. Thankfully this time around, titles are now targeting a more commonly expected 60 FPS, which is so much better. 120 frames, while possible, usually comes with massive trade-offs with a console in terms of fidelity and so on. It may be really not worth it yet. 
While you can play a wide gamut of third party and multiplayer games on a PlayStation of course, the platform is really known most for the blockbuster level Sony made single player titles like God of War, The Last of Us, Uncharted, and so on. You might see some folks deride these games as interactive movies, but hey, we're talking home theater gaming here, and interactive movies is exactly pretty much what we want to see shine in our spaces, right? These Sony titles come with just insane production value, they look better on console hardware than any games have any right to, and represent some of the best time you can have by yourself in a theater space playing video games. Last for consoles, we have the Xbox platform. I've talked in the past about Xbox on the channel, and in my opinion, Microsoft makes overall the best console gaming hardware and platform with the most complete, rounded out, consumer friendly and advanced technology. And the Xbox this generation comes in two flavors, the X and the S. Unlike the PlayStation, these boxes are actually differentiated by their horsepower, the X being the superior console and costing a couple hundred dollars more. As it is, I'm talking here about enjoying video games in a home theater environment that certainly is costing you some pretty significant amount of dollars to set up and enjoy. If you're buying an Xbox Series S to put into a premium home theater versus dropping a couple hundred dollars more to get the X and have the most powerful gaming console hardware ever made, WTF, you're just doing it wrong. There's no debate here, go buy a Series X. Xbox gives you the similar 4K, HDR, and positional audio like the newest PlayStation. However, as mentioned, Microsoft takes things further on the tech side. They're actually moving on supporting Dolby Vision for gaming, and they have specific partnerships and support with Dolby as well for real Atmos in games. Microsoft pushes the tech and performance envelope further than Sony does. You can also play the wide gamut of third-party and multiplayer games on the Xbox with arguably the superior online gaming platform in Xbox Live. And Microsoft now owns a massive amount of game development power in game studios that are going to bring a whole new wave of first-party games to the platform. There's a ton of quality and variety to be found in Microsoft Studio games too, whereas the Sony games often follow similar design patterns being third-person open-world adventures. If I were to choose only one console for my theater space, and as much as I like them and as much as the Sony games are exceptional, I would have to choose the Xbox. But hey, just buy them all. You probably already spent like tens of thousands of dollars on your dedicated room already. The last gaming platform to touch on, of course, is PC. PC is exceptional, but it's also much more complex and fraught with pitfalls in a theater environment. So I'll say right off the bat, if you're not on a pretty decent technical level involving hardware and software, and you're not prepared to pump a good couple thousand dollars or more into building a gaming PC, then forget it. Just buy the consoles. They're awesome, still run really well, and you'll be so much better off for that choice. In reality, building a PC to even match or moderately exceed console horsepower specs requires spending a good deal more than the consoles themselves cost. So again, if you're not going to spend up for the real benefits of PC gaming, then just take it off the table and happily stick console. But if you want absolute eye-melting graphical horsepower, you want to run games in real native 4K or higher, max out visual settings which have a big impact on fidelity, and achieve this at 60 frames per second reliably or better than PC it is. And for the pleasure of this, you're going to pay for it in terms of cost and complexity. So one, just for reference, my Uber Gaming HTPC home theater PC cost me on the order of four grand. And at the time I record this, it's specced to a top of the line CPU with an Intel 11900K, GPU with an Asus 3080 Ti, 32 gig of fast DDR4 RAM, a two terabyte PCIe Gen 4 SSD on par with the Uber SSDs in the new consoles, plus a quality gaming motherboard, high watt power supply, and more. $4,000 is 10 times the cost of a PlayStation 5 Digital Edition console and eight times the cost of an Xbox Series S. But this PC can run verifiable circles around those console boxes. Two, someone is going to have to build and maintain this PC, and if that's not going to be you, probably a console is better. Yes, there are pre-built PC options nowadays, often commanding even more of a premium price over a DIY, but in the long run, even if someone else builds your computer initially, eventually that PC is going to need upgrades and maintenance both in hardware and in software, which is going to put you right back at square one. And if you can assemble hardware and maintain the operating system yourself, again, just don't, don't bother. It's easy for someone with a lot of experience doing it to say that building a PC and such isn't that difficult. And in many ways nowadays, 
It's not as challenging as it used to be, but again, if you're not interested to learn and do it and dig into troubleshooting when something will go wrong, then just don't. You'll only be inviting inevitable pain into your life. Get a council, turn it on, and enjoy it. Three, a PC is a bigger, hotter, louder thing. The more power you want out of it, the more volume you need, and the more air it needs to move. Don't think that you can go easily tossing a high-end CPU and GPU into a slim rack mount style case and call it a day. The parts will fry if they even fit at all. Expect that running the PC is going to heat up your rack and the surrounding area more than any other piece of video or audio gear by a good margin. And that's heat that might have a negative cycle effect on the other equipment around it. My experience also has been that PC is electrically noisy in addition to being physically noisy. A PC is possibly the only piece of gear in your rack that might have a third ground pin on its power cord. And when your other sensitive AV gear is all two-prong power cords, now you get the pleasure of ground loops and noisy electrical potential. This is a problem that has absolutely plagued my experience using a powerful gaming PC alongside home theater receivers, preamps, and amplifiers in a dedicated home theater environment. And I'll make a future video on this and how I currently have it solved in my system. And this is a legit concern even with good clean power. I have a dedicated 20 amp circuit feeding my AV rack and I run a high wattage cyber power line conditioning sine wave UPS on the rack too. And I still had to solve frustrating buzzing issues that my gaming HTPC introduced into the, into the environment. Honestly, I wonder most of the time why I even bother with PC gaming like this. But then when I'm running something like Red Dead Redemption 2 fully maxed out in native 4K, 60 FPS, maximum uber settings versus looking at the same game on a weaker console like even an xbox series x i'm reminded why i keep the pc around before we wrap up too i want to touch on a couple of other gaming caveats related to input and play in a home theater environment one keep in mind that gaming latency on a home theater projector is going to naturally come in higher than most flat panel or office monitor displays. It's just the nature of the game for projection. Thankfully, the premium projector makers like JVC and Sony care about this and they design for it. But I'd be really careful with the BenQs and the Optimas and others like that. The new NZ JVC series projectors as well were specifically targeted to gamers and are advertising some of the lowest input lag on a projector yet. But again, not every projector maker cares about this. And the more budget your projector, the more likely this element is to suffer. I found some of the newest, say, ultra short throw model projectors don't even come with a game mode. If you're not more of an experienced gamer, you might not really notice this too badly in practice, but keep in mind that this could affect your experience, at least if you're looking to be successful in some of the latest online competitive type games. It's not a huge deal, but it's a logistic. Two, home theater builds often place source equipment and such away or out of the room itself. And by and large, you're going to be gaming with a gamepad that is wirelessly connected via Bluetooth or some special protocol to the gaming system. So if you need to position your console far away where your gear is, through multiple walls and or inside a metal Faraday cage, like your gear rack, this could negatively affect the gamepad's ability to stay connected to the gaming device during a gaming session. And that's incredibly frustrating, so plan accordingly. In my setup, I keep my gaming machines up on top of my rack in the separate room and out away from the wall versus having them inside the metal rack and up against the physical boundary wall. I'm also trying to connect four gaming to two different rooms to the same equipment from their installed location. But thankfully, both of those rooms are adjacent proximity to the gear, and so it works through one wall while I'm in the theater and through the floor kind of diagonally down from the living room. Lastly, if being new to gaming or being intimidated that you're not gonna be any good at it or whatever is holding you off from giving it a try, I'll say two things to that. One, you don't have to play competitive online games. Go for those single player or family fun experiences and just enjoy. I hardly play competitive online stuff myself. Two, games pretty much universally come with difficulty sliders and there's no shame in playing on easy mode. The goal is to have fun in a home theater centric and interactively immersive manner. If you're an expert experienced gamer and you bump all your stuff up to hard, great. If you're new or your gaming skills are maybe a little less sharp, so be it. Go easy mode. My friend Taurus Baker at the Fun Waste of Time affectionately refers to easy mode as fun mode. And that's a better designation that I agree with. So that's gaming and a whole bunch of considerations with regards to enjoying it in a premium home theater environment. By all means, get plugged in and play. 
there are some amazing experiences to be had in video games that are right up there with or better than movies, TV, and music. Gaming is a completely flexible hobby as well for anyone to enjoy. If you'd like some gaming guidance for your home theater, please post in the comments. And as always, please click, click, click for the likes and the subscribes. Thanks.